You can do it. There you go. Oh, can I do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at <laughs> Foot came off the pedal. That did not help. Today's bike of choice is a jack of all trades, the Hemingway Cruiser. And together we're going to take you on an adventure through some of the most beautiful scenery that we've seen on the channel yet. Not only will I be taking full advantage of the massive fat tires on this bike, but I'll be going through some sketchy situations where you'll get to see the full advantage of a hub drive motor over a mid drive. These are situations that not only benefit the hub drives, but almost require it. I see far too many review videos on fat tire bikes where people just cruise around city streets and smooth bike paths. Now that's fine because these bikes can handle that no problem, but there are other models which are much better suited for city travel if that's all you're going to be doing. Fat tire bikes on the other hand are meant to do light off-roading and trail rides. They're at home in these situations. So we need to find out if it's capable of withstanding that for a long period of time. And what this means to me, and probably you, is that companies making fat tire bikes need to build them strong enough to withstand these situations on a regular basis. Seeing that Hemingway only makes fat tire bikes, it's literally part of their motto on the side of the box, they have big shoes to fill. Let's find out if they can. My current fleet of electric bikes is pretty limited, so I don't have much of a way of knowing how many bikes out there come with the following options. But there are a few things here I'd like to point out that Hemingway got right, which I've complained about on my other bikes. So even if you're in the market for a different bike altogether, these are things you might want to consider looking for. So far my two biggest complaints I've had about electric bikes that I've tested is the lack of custom pedal assist levels and the fact that you cannot use the throttle when the pedal assist is set to zero. Now unfortunately Hemingway's Cruiser does not allow you to use the throttle when the pedal assist is set to zero, but they give you the next best thing which in my opinion makes it so it just doesn't matter. Not only does the Cruiser allow you to set how many pedal assist levels you have, but it allows you to precisely tune each level. This is great for a couple of reasons. First, in the lowest pedal assist level, I can set the bike to its slowest speed, meaning that when I'm traveling through sketchy situations or a lot of bog, the pedal assist is not trying to jolt me up to a predetermined speed. It's basically applying such minor assistance that it really feels like you're doing most of the work, and if you need to punch the throttle to get through something, you have full power available at all times. So I'm in my lowest pedal assist. It's about five and a half to six miles an hour, my lowest gear. And it's always given me just a little bit of power to push through this really soft sawdust. And if I need more, I just pull the throttle. So we're climbing a hill. Oh, it doesn't look like it in the camera, it never does. Whoa, okay. <laughs> There's the red mud. So we're not going to touch the pedals. Just because I do not want to get that into my cassette. Oh God. <laughs> One thing about red mud is it is extremely slippery. And even though we got these fat tires, they got their limits. Two wheel vehicles in red mud they don't mix very well. And lastly, what has me most excited about this feature is the fact that I can set each speed to precisely match up to the cadence on every gear that the cassette has to offer. For me, this means that none of the gears on the cassette are wasted. I can set my precise speed with pedal assist to match up to each gear, and my cadence will never run away. It will take a few test rides for you to set each pedal assist level to match the cadence for each gear, but I just did this on my way to and from work each day until I had it right where I wanted it. Having all these options and, ha and letting you customize the exact speed of every single pedal assist, and I do mean to like the half mile an hour, so very, very good customization. But having all those options means that None of my gears on the cassette will ever be useless. 
I will always have a pedal assist for each one to precisely set my speed. And this way, I don't run out of cadence. Now, unfortunately, I had to do a bit of digging to find out how to do that. I had to watch a couple of videos and it wasn't in the manual. And the manual, well, at least as far as I could tell, does not show you how to set customized pedal assist levels. So I really wish that they would put it in the manual, but I am glad that it's there. At least it's there. Now, as you can see, I'm just, I'm shifting up through the cassette and I'm upping my pedal assist level each time and my knees aren't running away from me. I felt it was important to showcase these features early in the video because I feel they're important to anybody who might be in the market for an electric bike no matter what price range. It's in my opinion that every electric bike within reason should include these features even if they're somewhat limited. They're only programmed options so they should have no significant impact on the price of a bike, but they improve the quality of life when riding, especially on long rides, so much that it's really something most if not all bikes should have. Now let's go ahead and take this bike on a nice adventure where we take advantage of its full potential. I will return after the ride to give my first impressions thoughts and see how well the bike held up. Smooth sailing at the beginning of our little adventure here. A short stretch along the highway, I think two miles. And then it'll be back on to cruising back roads. This is always the sketchiest part because this is the highest potential for getting a flat tire. Beautiful view though. It was a gorgeous morning. basketball uh, backboard the only thing left of whatever used to live there I don't know how, but this thing's even quieter than the KBO Breeze, and that bike was quiet.
in front of me is gumbo, red mud, clay, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's that stuff that gives me hell on uh, most of my bikes. It'll build up on the tires. It'll get especially around the side and it'll get sucked in by the chain on the gas motors and on the pedal bikes. If you pedal through this stuff, the chain's going to suck it up and just play hell on your cassette. So with the hub drive motor, I'm just going to throttle through here. I'm not going to pedal at all. Try and keep as much of that stuff off of my chain as I can. Two wheel vehicles in red mud. They don't mix very well. All right, looks like we're out of the thick of it. So hopefully I caught it in time and didn't suck it in. Yeah, okay, see what I mean? So it piled up on the chain, but only right here at the tire because I didn't pedal. So it didn't get sucked into the cassette. So uh, obviously I'll wait to do this until I get, until I know I'm out of it, but I can just flick it off, at least most of it. I'm still gonna have to give her a good cleaning when we get home, but here you go guys. I got a present for you. It's that time of year. Fourth of July is almost here. <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. <laughs> See if we can wash off some of this red mud. I think that made it worse. Yeah, definitely made it worse. <laughs> I ain't touching these pedals until I know all this crap's off my tires. You can hear it in the uh, brake rotors because it's so sticky if you don't wash it out. It'll actually eat away your brake rotors like sandpaper. All right, well, good thing we still got a lot of battery. Uh, looks like we're going to be using a whole lot of power through here. All right, this is uh, this is gonna be as bad as it gets.
As usual, I'll need a time machine to tell you whether or not this is a good or bad bike, so we'll do some more testing with it throughout the future months, put many more hundreds of miles on it to see how well it lasts. But for now, I can tell you what my first impressions are and whether or not I think there could be improvements made to the bike. For build quality of the frame and critical components, I see no issues. This looks like a very sturdy frame that can handle a fair bit of abuse. The 750 watt motor has what I would consider to be adequate power for my riding situations. There was never a point during any of my adventures where I felt like the motor was underpowered. However, I do feel that at certain situations, especially going uphill through this mud, that it was close to its peak potential. Ideally for me, if I was to ride through situations like this all the time, I would prefer probably a 1000 watt motor. But as it sits at this price range, I'm not disappointed. Out of all the bikes I've tested so far, this has the largest battery capacity at 17.5 amp hours. They tout quite a long range on this cruiser, something we will test after it's had many recharge cycles. They also claim to only use Samsung or LG cells in their batteries, which is great for longevity. Another customizability option in the display is that you can actually set the exact voltage when you lose each one of the bars on the readout. Ideally, I would still like to see a voltage readout for ease of long distance riding, but being able to set your own custom battery bar indicators is a definite bonus. The only out of the box issue this bike had is that the crank set felt like it was a little loose. I can feel some clunk when I pedal. Not a big deal to me as it's easy to adjust, but just keep that in mind. The only damage I noticed after riding through these sketchy situations is that one small plastic clip that holds the rear brake cable in place was lost on the trail, so I just replaced it with a zip tie. Personal preference for me, but I would have liked to see some way to disable the bike's electronic system like a keyed ignition. I consider the front and rear lights to be adequate for safe nighttime riding, however the headlight looks a lot brighter than it actually is. It's decent for modest speeds, but in complete darkness you're not going to be going full throttle. And personally, I always like to add an extra taillight to the bike. For me, I put it on my backpack. Thankfully, the bike has a USB port on its heads-up display, so you can get around upgrading the headlight by just adding an extra one to your handlebar that's permanently charged off the bike. You can also use it for your phone and camera, of course, but it's only a 1 amp output, so high-demand devices are probably going to charge very slowly. Each one of my electric bikes is unique in their own way. One's urban oriented, the other's a folding fat tire bike, and this one's an all-terrain jack of all trades. But for my riding style and environment, I find this one to be the best value so far. The seemingly sturdy build quality, fat tires, adequate 750 watt motor, and large capacity high quality battery make for the best value I've tested at this price point of about $1,500. And so long as the bike continues to perform as it is for many more miles to come, we'll say that it's worth it, but that's yet to be seen. So I hope you guys got some useful information out of today's video, or at the very least were mildly entertained. And until next time, ride safe.